ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಯದುನಂದ್ ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ ದಂಡವತ್ ಪ್ರಣಾಮ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ದಿ ಮಾಂಗ್ಸ್ ಪಾಡ್ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಸಚ್ ಆನರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಲಾಂಗ್ ಚೆರಿಜ್ ಡಿಸೈಯರ್ ಟು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಯು ಆನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಫೋರಮ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಬೀನ್ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ಐ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟೆಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಫೋರಮ್ ಯು ನೋ ಇಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೈ ಯು ಕುಡ್ ಸೇಫ್ ಫಾಂಡ್ ಡಿಸೈರ್ಸ್ ಟು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಸಮ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ಆನ್ ವೇರಿಯಸ್ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ಸ್ ವಿತ್ ಯು ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಬೀನ್ ದ ಚೇರ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರ ಅಡ್ವೈಸರಿ ಕೌನ್ಸಿಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಯುರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಪಬ್ಲಿಷ್ಡ್ ಆಥರ್ ಆನ್ ಸೆವರಲ್ ಯು ಕುಡ್ ಸೇ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಡೆಲಿಕೇಟ್ ಇಶ್ಯೂಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದೆಮ್ ಟುಡೇ ಬಟ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ವೆರಿ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ಫುಲ್ ದಟ್ ಫೈನಲಿ ವಿ ಕುಡ್ ಅರೇಂಜ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯು ಕುಡ್ ಸ್ಪೇರ್ ಯುವರ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸೋ ಮಚ್ ಫಾರ್ ಜಾಯ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ವೆರಿ ಮಚ್ ಫಾರ್ ಇನ್ವೈಟಿಂಗ್ ಮೀ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಆನರ್ ಯುವರ್ ಯುವರ್ ಪಾಡ್ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಇಸ್ ವೆರಿ ನೌನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರಫಾಂಟ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಗೆಸ್ಟ್ ಯು ಇನ್ವೈಟ್ ಸೊ ಫಾರ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಆನರ್ ದಟ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಇನ್ವೈಟಿಂಗ್ ಮೀ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ವೆರಿ ಮಚ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ ಸೊ ನಾ ಐ ಥಾಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸಿಂಗ್ the to- on the topic of one of your books i think that was your first book which you wrote on s- s- reexamining sanyas ashram in the contemporary world especially with respect to iskon so before we go into that maybe could you tell briefly about your journey to krishna consciousness and journey within krishna consciousness you have done a lot of uh, services especially in the education ministry as well as mm-hmm. other services so if you could briefly uh, describe your services as well as your introduction then we can start with that if that's okay with you yes that's fine i i met the devotees through some of my friends when i was 14 this was in 1977 we had a group of a youth group among friends of parapsychology and ufos oh okay and and then we started to practice yoga we got we, through that we got into 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 yoga like okay and some some of my friends were started to visit the temple in, in barcelona we were living in a place known as mataro which is located 30 kilometers from barcelona okay. so my friends visited the temple and they taught me about krishna consciousness my my uh the, the two main friends who 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 influenced me were are known as santi and juan manel and later on juan manel was initiated as jagannath mishra das okay so so they they taught me to about about krishna consciousness and then i started to visit the temple and in a period of one year and a half i moved to live to the temple during that period i was chanting 16 rounds at home and following the principles the first month my parents were pushing me to eat meat because i was only 14 but after a few months i managed to convince them to come to a deal that they could be a vegetarian even if they were not okay that's another story but uh, so so i i moved to the temple in the beginning of uh, of 1979 so you must have still been if you're just 14 that means you must have been in early college at that time or well, yes in, in those years uh, i finished the the compulsory education which was called uh, in spain it was called general basic education it, it a bit different from primary and secondary uh, and then i started to work for one year because that this was part of the deal so that they will allow me to become a vegetarian that they will i i told them when i i grow up i will go to live to the temple anyway so okay. better please allow me to work i bring some money home and you allow me to be a vegetarian because they were saying that if they had to cook separately for me my mother was saying it will be more costly 
and they, they couldn't, they couldn't, they didn't have the economy to do that. I think it was an excuse in, in one way, but, but in some sense, it's true they were tied financially. Oh. So I started to work for one year. So I, so I was not studying, I, I, I was studying in the beginning, but I, could, I quit my, my studies to do one work in order to make a deal with my parents. Oh, okay, that's remarkable. So then, so you joined, you were from Spain itself and you joined in Spain itself at that time? Yes. Yes, and I was based in Spain all the time through and until I, I shifted from 2002 to 2014, my base shifted to, to, to Radadesh for, oh. to, in order to serve at Bhaktivedanta College. Okay, so it's remarkable. I mean, you did not, did not get so much education, but you became a pioneer of education in our movement. So, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you had a, your innate interest in scriptural study or how, how did uh, that, that become a prominent service for you? Yes, actually it happened. I started to read uh, systematically Srila Prabhupada's books by by the, the influence of His Holiness, Keshavavarati Goswami Maharaj, who at the time was serving in Spain. He was the regional secretary for Spain during the Sonal Acharya years. Okay. Bhagavan Maharaj at the time was the, the GBC and Sonal Acharya for Spain. And Keshavavarati Maharaj was, was the regional secretary. And he inspired me very much to read Srila Prabhupada's books. So this made me very, uh, naturally became very interested in, in learning. Even I learned English by reading Srila Prabhupada's books. Okay. Because yes, at the time we had only translations into Spanish up, up to the middle of the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. So when mm. I when I came to that point, if I wanted to read more, Sri uh, Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita, I needed to learn English. So I I learned it with uh, a dictionary, and of course I had some basic notion of English from school. So so in this way, that this were my my beginning of, of true education, we could say, in terms of being educated through Srila Prabhupada's books. That's amazing. So that ethos of systematic study of scripture, you continued that not only in your life, but then you started sharing that with others also. Hmm. So uh, how did you, I mean, we could discuss about education itself as a big subject. But uh, considering that your first book was on the Sanyas Ashram, which is, I would say, regarding your book, it may be among the first uh, books in our movement, apart from maybe the ISKCON Communications Journal and, uh, and Purna Chandra Maharaj's book on uh, obstacles on the spiritual path, which is so candidly self-critical or at least self-reflective. So... So could you share what inspired you to write that book and how, how you develop that subject basically? Yes, the, the context of how I, des I decided to write this book was that during the 12 years, I was serving as, as principal at the Bhaktivedanta College in Radhadesh. The college was working, we were offering a degree accredited first by the University of Lampeter in Wales in the UK. And later on, we, we established a partnership with the University of Chester in, also in the, in the UK. So during that period, the, the scholars who taught the academic modules of the degree program 
many of them were coming from the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. Shonaka Rishi Prabhu is the director for the center, and he, he was the main visionary for the beginning of Bhaktivedanta College. So in the beginning, my main role as the principal was to take care of the of the of, of coordinating the the courses and interacting with the teachers and the students and taking care of the students both uh, academically and spiritually in coordination with the tutors so at some point the university of of Lampeter offered me the option of uh, studying a master's degree because I, I was um, for, for a, a number of years, I think six or seven years, I was serving as the principal and I guess they saw I could function well in the academic um, educational world. So, so they offered me the, uh, um, a scholarship so that they could do a, a master's degree. Okay. For that, I had to submit one application in the in the British universities. They have what they call accreditation of prior learning and accreditation of prior life experience, prior experience in life. So I submitted a, an application to be admitted for the master's to the master's program. The master's was in focused on Indic spiritual traditions. Hmm. So naturally, it relates very well to, to Krishna consciousness. And I, I submitted my CV of what I had done throughout the years in ISKCON presented in an academic language so that the, the university could relate to it. Oh, okay. And, uh, but then specifically, why the topic of sannyas you felt with respect to discussing on, um, for academic study? Yes, this was the topic I chose for my dissertation. This was, if I remember correctly, around 2008, I was a Sanyas candidate for several years and I was about to take Sanyas. I, I was initiated as a Sanyas in 2009. So I thought, let me, let, let me select a topic for the dissertation, which is of my interest, both in terms of personal interest that will be useful for me to learn, to learn something. And, and because the step of taking sannyas was a, a, a big step I was going to, to take. So I thought this it will be good to, 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 do, to do so, to go in depth into the topic. And I also saw it was very much related to to the movement, because I, I, I had in, in the movement, for example, I had been initiated by one of the Sonal Acharyas who gave up the Sanyas Ashram. I, I had been serving seven years as president in two different projects in Spain during the 80s and the 90s. I had been regional secretary for Spain during seven years. And I, uh, the reason why I'm mentioning these, these positions is because I had seen the effect of Sanyasi's giving up in the Yatra and I had, I had to deal with it in terms of having a leadership position at the national or local level in Spain. Okay. It, in the decade of the 80s, the Sonal Acharya gave up. So naturally this created a, a, a crisis, big crisis of faith in many devotees. In, in, the, in the middle of the 90s, 
one of our GBC representatives, very, very respected by, by, by the devotees, also gave up the Sanjas Ashram. This created like a second wave of uh, faith crisis, many devotees, even, oh, even, okay. up to, uh, even up to the point that New Braja Mandala, the main, main temple in Spain, was proposed to, for selling at the end of the 90s. We couldn't, we were not able to, to maintain it properly, and this created a big division in the, in the Yatra. So in, in one sense, my, my study on Sanyas has many autobiographical elements there. That oh, okay. It was something that affected me both as a person and, and also uh, as someone who had a position of leadership and had to deal with issues arising from the problems within the Sanjas Ashram. Another consideration is that I was going to enter into the Sanjas Ashram and I was somewhat, um, I, I'm not sure what's the word. If it, uh, we could say a little scare, a, a little scare in that if more bigger personalities than me were not able to sustain the Sanyas Ashram, how can I make it sustainable in my case? And, and don't do the same, don't follow the same path mm. in terms of giving up the Sanyas Ashram and again contributing to, to to create difficulties. Um, it, I don't mean to undermine the, all the good things. I have very high respect for all the sannyasis mm. who sacrificed and gave, even if they gave up all the, what they did, I have very high respect for them. But what I mean is that I would like, if I take sannyas, sustain it until the end of, of my life, and be, be able to uh, offer a contribution in this way. So I thought I need to go through, to, to check the journey of other, of sannyasis in ISKCON who are ahead of me. And this should include not just sannyasis, but also ex sannyasis out of respect for them. And mm -hmm. also to learn from them to, to, to learn what are, the, what are the, the key factors to success and key factors to failure. What failure? I mean, failure, I say quote, in terms of that every soul has, has his own journey. And even if somebody gave up the Sanyas Ashram, doesn't mean that that person will not go back to Godhead before someone who gives up his body in the Sanyas Ashram. Because you go, as you, as you know, going, going back, come back to Godhead does not depend on externals. Hmm. That's interesting. If we look at the case, we look, we at the case of Ajamil, uh, he was not, not so, I mean, from the, he, he didn't act as a Paka Brahmana, but he went back to Godhead in that very lifetime, according to Srimad Bhagavatam. And Bharata Maharaj, who was, a, who was so good in his duties, in his Varna Ashrama duties, he was so impeccable that the whole planet was named after him, but it took him two more lifetimes, even though he was situated in Baba Bhakti, according to Vishwanatha Chakravarti Thakur. So Maharaj, two, three questions here. That's, uh, 
it's like both as you said analytical plus autobiographical mm. so first of all like i started by discussing how about it is so candidly self critical without being uh, see in general one one response is to just criticize and condemn everything the other response is to like, sugar coat everything and try to say nothing is wrong so to find that balance in between is is difficult so two three broader questions now i lived in india and i i grew up in a reasonably more religious than spiritual family but uh, in many ways for people in india their their piety their religiosity what i to extend their spirituality it has never been hugely dependent on the sanyas ashram there are of course people who follow particular gurus and for them their guru is a central thing central thing but beyond that there is a large cross section of society who do some level of religiosity and i would say it's not just religiosity in the sense of rituals some level of spirituality is also there not huge not certainly like the serious sadhana that we have within our movement spending several hours every day but something so is it that the centrality of sanyas or centrality of sanyasis in the building of faith was that a huge factor in traditional indian culture as far as you saw you to the extent you examined or you studied it certainly we know, Some, yeah just certainly we know that there are the prominent uh, teachers shankaracharya ramanacharya madhavacharya in the vaishnava tradition as well as in the general vedantic tradition they were sanyasis but apart from that to whatever extent uh, i have seen there have been multiple expressions so is it that sanyas ashram had excessive important in iskon as compared to what it was in the traditional india so there are two parts to this question maybe you could they are related but i just thought of articulating both yes uh, what what i found out during the research before uh, studying going through the interviews to the to the sanyasis i thought it will be good to look at the historical development of the sanyas ashram from classical times in india i mean based on shastra because we cannot other than looking at the shastras we don't have like we cannot do an anthropological or sociological study of that of those years unless we will have the time machine we, we could go back and and look through it i don't know if that ever will develop but we cannot do that so so we are whatever we 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 and that's not to undermine how essential and most imp, uh, and, and most important is the teachings of shastra but we do find that sometimes what's written in shastra and what we and, and the popular practice varies to a certain extent like like for example in and this this will bring this will be another topic for another discussion but if we take if we take the 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 role of the guru it, like if we take the the version of the shrimad bhagavatam the grihastas like like the seventh canto of shrimad bhagavatam speaks about the wife of the spiritual master which indicates that the gurukulas were run by by grihastas not by sanyasis in classical times if, if we go back to 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 the to the, the what we call the vedic period like meaning thousands of years back but then in, in practice many many vaishnava sampradayas they have sanyasis as the primary initiators 
some sampradaya sanguine is gone. We have some grihastas giving initiation, but the majority of, of Diksha Gurus are sannyasis, which is not exactly what was happening from what we, we get from reading the Shastras in classical mm -hmm. Vedic times. But, but it seems that for, from, it seems that the, 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 the figure of the sannyas, the sannyasis as the, the gurus of the grihastas and leaders of, of sampradayas seems to be more like a, something that happened in the medieval period in terms of being organized. Yes. And, and Sripada Shankaracharya, actually he, he is credited uh, by, both by his followers and, and by, by, by Snavas, Srila Prabhupada refers to him as the, I, I know the expression in the translated version into Spanish, but a very, very strong, very firm, very staunch teacher, very big, big teacher who, who, ex, who expelled Buddhism from India and reestablished the teachings of the Vedas. Yes. And he, did so, he did so as a sannyasi and he established the Advaita Vada, the, the monistic philosophy yes. as, as a step forward from, from nihilistic thought uh, to going back to, to the Vedic perspective. Yes, and then later, later on, other sannyasis coming from actually from an Advaita line or, or originally like Madhvacharya or Ramanuja Charya. Ramanuja Charya was, yes, he was first, he had Yadava Prakash as Guru, who was a follower of Shankaracharya. And later on, he, he, I mean, very soon as a child, he, he questioned him and he rejected him. And later on, he, takes, he took shelter of uh, Sri Yamun, Yamunacharya. Yes. And he became, became the leader of the, of the Sri Sampradaya. And he, he was a, a sannyasi who, who took, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, he took sannyas, self-initiated himself. He was a yeah. Svatanta sannyas. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur did the same on the basis yes. of the president of Sri Ramanujacharya in the Vaishnava lineage. That's true. So it's interesting, Maharaj, what you mentioned this. In fact, uh, uh, I'm just taking it one step backward. It seems in India, if we look at the Ramayana Mahabharat, uh, there are uh, both uh, renunciate. Uh, renunciate brahmanas and gurus and priests and there are householder brahmanas gurus and priests and there doesn't seem to be a huge difference between the two of them when lord ram uh, lord ram goes to the forest you know, he meets different uh, different sages and they are all referred to as sages whether they are married or not so mm -hmm. in that sense the the emphasis on sanyas san uh, it, the emphasis seems to be more on wisdom and devotion and spirituality than that much on sannyas per se. Not that sannyas was not respected, of course it was, but it didn't seem to have that much emphasis. So from a historical perspective, there are some broad Hindu Vedic scholars, they say that the sannyas was emphasized by, by, the, by Buddhism and Jainism more. And then one of the ways in which that influence was countered was also by, Shankar, by Shankaracharya because in one sense, Buddhism, Jainism and Advaita Vada, they are to significant extent world rejecting philosophies. Yes, I will agree with your analysis. Yes. Yeah. So the, actually, yeah, with Srila Prabhupada, in many, in many places in his book, in many purple, when he talks about Sanyas, he refers to the 
Anashrita Karmapalam verse, first verse of Yes. Which actually refutes the the monistic Advaita Vada concept of sannyas. Yes. And the, the, or, the orthodox approach to sannyas by saying that the sannyas is not somebody who doesn't um, light any fire nor performs any yes. duty, but actually somebody who performs his duty with detachment. That is true. So, in one sense, the Bhagavad Gita is quite strongly against uh, renunciation of the world. Although we could say that is more contextually driven because Arjuna had important duty to perform. And the Bhagavatam is quite, you could say, renunciation driven, renunciation centered. Because Parikshit Maharaj also, you know, he had already decided to renounce the world and he was focusing on the Lord. So, there is, so the context makes a good amount of difference in the emphasis within the content. Both talk about spirituality and about bhakti, but the context makes a significant difference in what, what is stressed. So the Bhagavatam seems to repeatedly talk about renouncing the world and talking about how family life is entangling. But that doesn't seem to be the tone of the Bhagavad Gita or the Mahabharata or the Bhagavatam in general. Mm-hmm. So so, so the point I was making is that uh, if we consider that, <clears throat> so you talked about how the problems that sannyasis had, that led to faith crisis for many devotees. So, so my question was that, uh, why I brought this historical context is that, was it, uh, uh, I wouldn't say, n- was it like an exceptional situation that led to an overemphasis on sannyas ashram as the foundation of people's faith? Means were there some special circumstances because of which within our movement sannyas was overemphasized and in the Indian tradition or in general, even in our movement for subsequent times, sannyas ashram need not be the foundation or the cornerstone of people's faith. Uh, I hope I'm making my question clear. Yeah, yes, let me see if I can. If, if I don't reply what you, you're asking, please let me know and I, yes, I, can, I, I, I can try again. So, the, I mean, my perception is that Shabupat engage everybody, both sannyasis and grihastas in the mission of preaching. Because, for example, if we look at how the movement spread in Europe, we had three Krihasta couples who, who came and who started in London. The, the, the legendary uh, couples, Shema Sundaru and Malati Devi, uh, the Guru Das. Hmm. Um, Mukunda no Maharaj at the time, Prabhu and, and Janaki Devi. And they were the missionaries who started. And Prabhupada was very, sometimes even he will express um, some, uh, not some, but actually a lot of satisfaction in that his Rihasta disciples did what Sanyasis couldn't accomplish before, establishing Krishna consciousness in, in the West. So Srila Prabhupada used both Sanyasis and Grihastas. I, I will suggest that part of the reason why the, the Sanyas Ashram was overemphasized, it it's due to lack of maturity in the understanding of the of, of the ashramas of all of us as a society. And in one way, it's a natural development because we were, um, the, the movement was very young when, when Srila Prabhupada 
physically departed from this world, we were very young. So there were quite a number of misunderstandings which contributed to, to an some, sometimes unhealthy emphasis on external renunciation on the externals and not so much on the on the essence of of the ashramas, both applying it to to the, to the sannyas ashram and also to the other ashramas. Okay, so so it's more you could say that the two things here, circumstantially because of the newness of the movement, Prabhupada also emphasized it, but there was also immaturity in uh, not immaturity in how we understood and applied it mm. so yes so maybe you could explore both of these so when you talk about emergency it's interesting that uh, you know when Prabhupada when he was tr trying to preach in India he said that his Guru Maharaj came in his dream and told him that take sannyas and his god brother also told him that you cannot preach unless you are a sannyasi. So it does seem that at least in the Indian context, sannyas as a foundation for, for preaching are as a, not necessarily a foundation, are the, as an important uh, uh, position social and for preaching seems to have a lot of precedence. Right? Mahaprabhu also took sannyas. Bhaktisanthi Thakur did that. Shri Prabhupada did that. So how so that you could say in India since things had changed and there was some amount of religious spiritual resurgence and the renounced order was respected uh, because there are some Advaitic sannyasis also and Indians even Christianity which came to India was to some extent there were missionaries whether they were renounced or not there still missionaries were there so there could be various factors but did my question is that did renunciation itself make such a big difference uh, for out for outreach in the West? Means for people, yes, yeah, this was just some some you could say strange or exciting culture and practices and worldview coming from the East. So whether the teacher of that was a renunciate or a non-renunciate, did that make a big difference in? Uh, in the effectiveness of the outreach? I will, I will say yes and no, and I'll to, to explain. Like Srila Prabhupada uh, initiated a number of devotees as sannyasis. If I remember correctly, the numbers were about 54. I may, in the statistics, the, the, there were not complete statistics in what I mean, the Sanjas ministry was created in the early 90s. So it could be that some, some Sanyasi disciple of Srila Prabhupada who didn't like much would have filtered and instead of 54, which is the number I, I found out in my research, 54 devotees took Sanyas from Srila Prabhupada from 1967 to when Srila Prabhupada departed. Okay. So, so, so he gave sannyas to all these devotees and many of them became important leaders in movement and they were able to have an impact uh, both in ISKCON and also outside ISKCON. Because they didn't have family duties, so they could dedicate themselves 100% as leading missionaries. So they could also make new, like younger, train new devotees as brahmacharis, mm. lead projects. Srila Prabhupada referred in some of his letters discussing the Sanya Sashram to the sannyasis as a strong man, meaning they were by, by nature, they were leaders and they, they could make things happen. 
And usually he will give sannyas to the Buddhists, he will think they will be capable to make things happen in terms of missionary work accomplished. That's very interesting, yes. Maharaj. So just, just to, uh, just a quick observation on this. Two things. See, one is here, it seems to be more of a logistical perspective, not a faith perspective. That the sannyasis, they don't have family responsibilities. So they can have more resource. So they can devote their time and energy for doing outreach work and sharing Krishna Bhakti with others. And now... <laughs> that does not itself convey the aspect of faith because we can say within our movement we don't have that system but in at least in protestant churches and even in islam they have people who are missionaries who are married and then the mission takes care of the financial needs of the couple and they also they also do a lot of work in fact uh, missionaries there are other hindu groups also which do some kind of work like that so i'm not sure that that logistical problem solving that requires sannyas itself. I'm sorry if I'm taking a little skeptical attitude. I'm just trying to understand. Yes, that's why, so that's why this, I said yeah. so yeah. So the logistical aspect is one thing. Second is the leadership aspect. But I would say that leadership aspect, which you said, that people who could get things done. Well, there are people who are, in fact, most of the things that are done in the world, no matter how much our sannyasis do things, with all due respects to them. There are, there are people who lead companies and who are political leaders, corporate leaders. They also do a lot of things. And that doesn't re really require sannyas. So my, my focus was that there is a logistical requirement from, a, from the time perspective, from the talent or ability perspective. But uh, there's another aspect, which is the centrality of the faith. That, you know, that these are the people around whom our faith is based. So is that something which is, uh, which is just as an offshoot of the way things were presented? Or is that central to our, our understanding of bhakti itself? The, yeah, this is actually, this can, can pose a, a problem. Because if we think that our faith, uh, in, in one sense, I mean, the issue is um, ambivalent. There are two aspects. That's when I say yes and no, before I said yes and no, like I will say no in terms that what I mentioned before, that the first preachers, successful preachers in Europe were grihastas. And yes. many of them who open temples in, in America, were Grihasta couples, the majority of them, if not all. Okay. Uh, uh, so, so in that sense, it is no, that it is not required that it has to be a sannyasi. Also, the first, we, we learn from Trila Prabhupada Lilamrita, that the first GBC representatives, the first GBC, all of them were Grihastas. And then somehow, Srila Prabhupada, and Srila Prabhupada's idea, and it is written in some letters, we have to look at them and, and look at, the, at them closely if we want to go more in depth into the subject. But I, I do remember having read such letters that um, Srila, Srila Prabhupada's strategy was the, the the GBCs are Grihastas, I mean in the beginning, and the Sanyasis travel and preach. So in, in one way, the Sanyasis contribute to, to, sustain, to, to sustain the spirituality and the faith of the general devotees. And in, the, in that way, they act as Shiksha Gurus following the, the classical Taibar Nashrama system. The sannyasis act as a spiritual master of, of all the Varnas and Ashramas, including the Brahmanas. 
and they contribute to 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 remind those who rehastas who are distracted to remind them of Krishna and, and, and of their duties. It, in one way, it follows the, the classical ashram system. That's fascinating. So it, now when you spoke this, I remember in Lilamru, that was like a clear Prabhupada, clear emphasis of Prabhupada that uh, you, you are sannyasi, you should travel and preach. So Prabhupada was creating some kind of differentiation between, we could say, managerial roles and uh, educational or we could say traveling educational roles. So somehow now, late, maybe in the post Prabhupada period or after that itself, the most of the prominent GBCs uh, were sannyasis. So how did that change, Maharaj? Uh, well, during Sri Prabhupada's time, it seems that for whatever reason, again, the, the element of artistic and functionality is there. Because some of the original GVCs were initiated as san, they were grihastas and they became sannyasis. Like Satsvaru Maharaj is one okay. of them. Okay, Tamal Krishna Maharaj. I think Ridayananda Maharaj as well. I'm not sure if he's in the first list. I will have to, to check the, exactly the names. But some of these names were in the first list of GBCs and they were Grihastas. Okay. Rupanuga Prabhu, who also was initiated as a Sanyasi later on, hmm. and a few others. And Srila Prabhupada gave Sanyas to them. Okay, so, makes sense now, yes. Which which indicates that Srila Prabhupada was more concerned about the mission, and and th there are letters to sannyasis saying that you should do as I'm doing, and he mentioned the word managing as well. So okay. so it was not watertight, even though if in the beginning, ideally. Srila Prabhupada conceived, let the Grihastas manage and the sannyasis preach. Later on, he saw that some of the sannyasis were very good in managing. So also they can do some type of management. And he asked some of them to be GVCs in, in, in India. Like for example, he, he uh, he called Tamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj as to be seen in, in India because he was such a good manager. Okay. That's interesting. Good example. And he, in one sense, insisted that I want to preach. And Prabhupada didn't want him to do that. So I think, uh, but finally he insisted and then he went and to America and started Radha Mother Bus Party. So it does seem that to some extent, uh, what Prabhupada did was uh, that, I mean, this we, we can't really glimpse into, we can't know the mind of Srila Prabhupada. But if you look at his actions and his writings, it does seem that there were two things. One was that Prabhupada wanted to like recreate the traditional way of doing things. At the same time, Prabhupada wanted to keep the mission moving forward. And if that required uh, the overlapping of uh, traditional category roles or adjustment of certain things, Prabhupada seemed to give greater priority to that. Or at least a significant amount of priority to that. Maybe not greater necessarily. Yeah, I will agree with, with this analysis. Yes. Yes, Anand. So... So going so going back to at, at, at the yeah. moment at the excuse moment me. excuse me at the moment I'm serving as president of New Braja Mandala in Spain and I, I was not thinking that I will become a, a president of an ISCOM project again because as a sannyasi I was thinking I travel and preach but not don't get so much into management mm. but somehow my 
my GBC representative and the previous temple president here, who was a sannyasi, and other devotees asked me to do it. And then for me, it became clear that Krishna, through the devotees, was asking me I had to do this. And I happily accepted that service. Also looking into what Srila Prabhupada had done, that sometimes he did ask some sannyasis to become presidents of some projects. There are not many examples of that, but there are some. Like mm. for example, in Vrindavan, he asked Akshayananda Maharaj to, to be the president. So, so like that, there were different examples. Okay. So, so now going on, I mean, it's, it's remarkable, even in, could say, Scon India also, we have uh, several places. Bhakti Samut Maharaj is there, he's Sanyasi, the president of Belgao. We ha also have a few other places where Sanyasis are managerial leaders, and of course, many of the GBC members are Sanyasis. Mm. So, <clears throat> so, so you, when you said earlier, going back to the earlier question of yes and no, when Sanyasis were seen as the you could say the highest exemplars of how bhakti should be practiced then uh, if they had some problems in their sp personal spiritual life then that would shake the faith of the entire community whom they were inspiring so was this because they were sannyasis and they fell away or was it because they were gurus and they had problems means are there cases I of somebody who was not a guru but just a sannyasi and their falling also created problems because it seems that the institutional, the spiritual and the personal, all three are categories are overlapping over here. Like sannyas could be an institutional post. A guru is a spiritual post and the guru disciple is a personal inspirational relationship. So, in many cases, in many cases, they were sannyasis, guru, initiating gurus and GBCs. In, oh, okay. in, some of, in some of the cases, at least I had the experience of several of them here in, in Spain and Southern Europe, where they have been serving, several of them were the three, the three influential positions at once. But I think what had more impact was that they were gurus. Because the, the disciples were looking up to them as as good as God, as just okay. states. Hmm. And then when the guru go, goes astray, then it becomes a very big challenge for the faith of the disciple who is who is following that that personality. Hmm. So it's so we could say sannyas was one factor, but in one sense, most gurus were sannyasis. I think, apart from Jayatirtha Prabhu, none of the first gurus that Prabhupada appointed were not sannyasis, isn't it? Also, Bhagavan, Bhagavan Prabhu in the beginning, he was Rihasta, but both Jayatirtha and Bhagavan Prabhu took, took sannyas because of the social pressure of the time. So like Bhagavan started to initiate as a Grihasta. And, and possibly they could have remained, I mean, they could, I mean, that's assuming, maybe assuming too much, mm. but, but for the sake of the argument, we could say that as Grihastas, they were doing well. They, they, they were both good managers, good preachers, very powerful, very influential. They didn't need to take sannyas, and, but both took it and didn't go so well. Okay. <clears throat> that's, that's interesting. So when you, so that means by the time of during the <coughs> hmm, say late seventies itself, this, uh, if I may use the word the glamorization of the Sanyas Ashram had already started significantly because it seemed in the 60s, like you said, the um, 
Prabhupada sent his grahastha disciples to England for preaching also. So it doesn't seem that in the 60s at least there was that big of a difference between sannyasis and grahasthas. Kalakant Prabhu has written a book in which he calls, he uses the phrase the saffron 70s. So he says that was the time when saffron started becoming very prominent within his con. So would you broadly agree with that historical? I, I agree, yes. In, 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 the, in the study I did on Sanyas published in, in the book, I think I'm showing in case some of the, the participants of this podcast can, can see it. So, so in, in the book, I, there is a chapter on the history of Sanyas in, in, in ISKCON, how it developed. And, and yes, we see this, that it became more, more the, the emphasis on, on Sanyas became more prominent in the, in the 70s and more in the mid 70s, I will say. And then it continued after Srila Prabhupada's departure, physical departure. Uh, and this will may include also on some level of, of imitation of, and, and by saying this, I don't blame anyone. All of us were part of, of the process, but there was some element, some imitation of Srila Prabhupada's position as, as Diksha Guru by the new gurus, because they didn't have any, any point of reference other than Srila Prabhupada, and very little more. Mm-hmm. Maybe some of Srila Prabhupada's god brothers, those devotees who had some contact with them in India, but there was not much more reference in ISKCON than Srila Prabhupada, and therefore those who acted as, as gurus in the beginning started to act as such by some level of imitation of how Srila Prabhupada will do things. This may imply accepting a level of respect. In some cases, maybe they were not qualified to accept at that time. Maybe they needed more time to to accept that level of, of respect and worship. Yes, that's interesting. So, again, when you say they were not at that level, so this is uh, coming to more of. Uh, so there are two perspectives. One is that should the should as as members of a bhakti movement, should we be basing our faith on sannyasis? The, the principle itself that should the sannyasis be the exemplars of bhakti. Practice and second is whether a particular exemplar is mature or not, is mature enough or not. So, I think in your book you you do go a lot into the second aspect also, and we could come to that. But if uh, I mean if I need to summarize in uh, the first aspect, if you can, so to some extent, if I may say that there was a over focus on sannyas itself as a on sannyasis as the exemplars of bhakti during the first few years of our movement first two three decades at least uh, is that something which you broadly is your understanding also that there was an yes, over emphasis yes i will i will agree hmm. and 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 that's not necessarily uh, helpful for the for the mission. I, I don't mean to, to undermine the importance and the role of, of Sanyasis as role models in their own terms, because yes, Sanyas, that is the inner meaning of Sanyas, is full surrender unto, unto, unto the Lord. Hmm. So, in, so in that sense, that's, that's important. That's very important. And also Sanyasis are the spiritual masters of, of all the Varna Ashrama system of all the Varnas and Ashramas. So that element is there. 
it, we find it in, in Shastra and in the teachings of the Acharyas. But on the other hand, if we look at the Kibabia, Kibabi Prakibanyasi verse hmm. spoken by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to, to Sri Ramananda Roy, Ramananda Roy, he's, he's a Grihasta, he's, he's a, a Kayasta, a Shud Shudra, technically speaking, in, in, the, in, the, in, its, in the context, historical context where he was living. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is a Sanyasi and a Brahmana. And when Ramananda Roy is telling him that I cannot teach you anything, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is telling, is saying, no, no, the, the criteria is not what you are externally. You can be anything externally, but the criteria is whether you know or not Krishna Tattva. That's mm. the criteria. Jai Krishna Tattva, Tattva Veta Sai Guru Hoi. You can be Guru if you are, if you know Krishna Tattva. True, interesting. Yes, Mara, that is. So there is this dialectic uh, and both aspects are there within our tradition itself. So, so if we come to the current day situations, unless you want to take the podcast in some other direction. So, so in today's world, how much uh, importance does, do you think sannyas plays or sannyasis play how central are they in the outreach as well as in the in the we could say community formation or community building for for the for contemporary outreach especially in in the west we can say i will say it depends how active the sannyasi is if a sannyasi is active and preaching and inspires people then the, the, the then the influence can be very powerful but if a sannyasi is not that, that active, may not be that influential. Or maybe influential in, in an inspirational way. Sometimes we have some sannyasis who may be doing some BBT work and they, they, they give some classes in the temple, but they are not so prominent in preaching. Hmm. But, but, but maybe very inspirational because they, they are always there for the temple program and they are doing the service and they're for so many years uh, serving a very low in a very loyal way and they're very mature very philosophical and the what is feeling inspired by by them but may not that relevant in some context some really has to are, are are very powerful in preaching and sometimes they accomplish more than, than sannyasis. Yeah, that's I, interesting. Again, so, so, so I, I remember so, one time yeah. I, I heard that His Holiness Shivaram Swami Maharaj, I, I didn't hear directly, but someone told me that he made such a statement. So it's a secondary source. He mentioned that Her Grace Aruta Mataji the mother of Radhika Raman Prabhu and Gopal Hari Prabhu. You yes. You know them, eh? both. Yes, yes, of course, yes. They're both and wonderful the devotees and, and, and yes. uh, Oxford scholars. Uh, yes. Um, Mahabha said that she had done a service greater than many sannyasis by producing such wonderful uh, children devoted children who are preachers and who they both of both both sons are grihastas and they're doing wonderful service for for ISKCON. Mm. That's and, interesting. And, she has also, I mean her own, apart from her children, her own contributions are also there that she has written books about homeschooling and uh, how to teach using scripture, how to teach children using scripture. That is also a significant contribution. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, so overall, it does seem that uh, it's not so much the sannyas ashram as what one is doing in the sannyas ashram or what is one doing with the sannyas ashram that is critical. 
Yes, yes. Exact, exactly, yes. Yes, Maharaj. So now in terms of... Uh, I, I started traveling abroad from 2000, in the last decade, 2013-14. And to some extent... Oh, I, I, I was before the pandemic, I was spending, spending almost eight, nine months a year outside India, America primarily and UK, Australia, New Zealand. So uh, what I noticed is that to a significant extent, we have been able to reach out to Indians quite a bit, but not so much to, uh, now I, I, you are in Europe, so I don't know whether we can use the word Westerner for everybody in Europe, but, but the native people, you know, native is also not the right word, local people. We are not able to reach out the way we were reaching out in the West. Now in uh, India, the brahmacharis is, and sannyasis are the prominent preachers, but it's not like that. When grahasthas are preaching and if they are, they are teaching, if they present the philosophy in an attractive way, they also attract following. So do, would you say that uh, the, the reason for less outreach in the West that, that doesn't have much to do with the presence or non-presence of the renounced order. How much are they related? Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure it is that. I think, it, I, I think it is more, we need to update our strategies for preaching in the West. My conviction is that if Srila Prabhupada will be physically present at the moment, and he presented a seminar on this in the, in the ILS, in the last one in 2020, in Sri Mayapur. My conviction is that Srila Prabhupada will be sending many preachers from India to the West. Okay. Because Srila, Srila Prabhupada, like what he did in India, when he wanted to preach in India, and he was successful in the in the in the West. He he took some numbers of Western devotees preach, preachers and and took them to India to help him there. So naturally, if he will see that now India is flourishing and is growing, and you have now new temples in India as mushrooms. When when I say you, we have. I say we because the movement is one. Many new temples in India which grow very uh, quickly, very, very fast. I, I'm convinced Srila Prabhupada will send preachers from India to the West and will encourage, will request his followers to do something in the West because he wanted to preach to the locals. I don't know what you think about that, but this is my conviction based yeah. on what I have read from Srila Prabhupada's books, like the Bharata Bhumite Hoila verse, which is very much quoted by him. He will preach this even to, to any in, culture people in India who were not yet committed to Buddhists. What to speak of his disciples and grand disciples? How much more he will he will push them to do that? Okay, interesting. I know it, this is another topic, but it's yeah, it's it's related, and that's why I'm referring to it. You know, I I like the term also you used. Update our strategies. There are different words which we could use. Some people say adapt, adjust. Some people will say that all that is compromising. But I think update is a very apt word. Because yes, uh, we have to present according to time, place, and circumstance. Uh, you know, this could be a whole different subject. Mm. But uh, maybe from the since we are focusing right now on sannyas, just a couple of more questions about that. First is that uh, uh, in many ways, the world has changed the way it was in 1970s and the way it is now. Uh, things are quite different and uh, sanya, uh, just staying in the renounced order may be much more difficult in today's world than it was even 50 years ago. 
so and what you had mentioned about peer pressure pressure to take sanyas that also to a significant extent has decreased in our movement today uh, and in fact even if some devotees want to take sanyas they are encouraged to wait not even encouraged you could say they are expected or it's insisted that they wait for a significant amount of time so what are your comments about these two trends both in the outer world as well as within our movement with respect to the renounced order yeah yes in in one way we could say it is more difficult to remain a sanyasi but also on on the other hand because many of the devotees who are taking sanyas now in iskon are mature devotees and they have in one way or in or in, in many ways proven themselves i don't mean completely completely that the, the proven themselves in terms if we look at the sustainability of the ashram could be seen at the end of their lives but but still these are devotees who are mature both in age and in, in understanding and realization and preaching of krishna consciousness so naturally this has contributed to diminish the level of attrition in the sanyas ashram because it is not the same in shrila prabhupada's times some devotees took sanyas when they were 20 20 20 plus hmm. many of us will say he's a, he's a, he's a kid in one way colloquially speaking yes he just became a man this very very early but and some of them succeeded and did wonderfully for the whole life but also some did were not able to sustain it and it's very different if somebody is taking sanyas when when he becomes 50 or or 60 years old it's it's different you know what i mean so, so different in the sense that we as a movement have better understood what sanyas requires both from the individual perspective as well as the social perspective yes Or, okay yeah that is true so in one sense maraj what is uh, maybe the, the, since you mentioned it what is your understanding of the uh, why shila prabhupad gave people sanyas at the age of 20 or 25 because that was it was quite a herculean challenge for them and uh, and so was it from what i understood ravindra swarup wrote an article about this he says that that was what was necessary at that time for the spread of the movement and that's how our movement actually spread and it was like he he used the metaphor that it is like a ambitious uh, ambitious attack uh and in, in an attack like that there will be casualties so there were casualties but there were also significant successes so he uses the war metaphor to explain that but what are your thoughts about generally like i just said somebody is just a kid becoming a man uh, for them to renounce the world uh, it is a, it is quite non conventional at the very least y- yes i i mean one my my take based on the interviews i conducted to both sanyasis and ex sanyasis and hearing their opinions and then my own little self reflection on on the subject i think that shri prabhupad knew that some of them would not made it would not be able to sustain it but i also think that that he he, he also trusted that the probably the percentages were not what he estimated if we can express it in this way meaning meaning because sometimes we have heard several times when some devotee will not follow the vows of initiation that some in some occasions the prophet said but but you, you promise so he 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 trusted more the word that the people will if people promise something 
they will do it. Although he, in the same time, he knew it, it was difficult for, for to sustain a lifelong sannyas ashram. And he mm. gave, he, he, but he still took the risk. And in, in the book I published in the, like the, the introductory verse, said the Akbasra Dharman, Chananambuja, Harir verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, which is what I see Srila Prabhupada was seeing. The, the fact that he was at risk or some level of risk because of the urgency as well, he knew he could leave the planet at any moment. And he wanted to leave some leading persons and, and the Sanyasis will be like uh, the natural leaders if they will be able to, to follow his example. And I'll read the translation of the verse for those who are not familiar with, uh, with this verse. One who has forsaken his material occupation to engage in the devotional service of the Lord may sometimes fall down while in an immature stage, yet there is no danger of his being unsuccessful. On the other hand, an non devotee, though fully engaged in occupational duties, does not gain anything. Oh, okay. so, so my take on that will, will, will be that Srila Prabhupada was, he, he was aware that some will not make it, but, but maybe he didn't expect, we don't know, as you mentioned before, at least Srila Prabhupada was, was thinking, he saw the Sanyasis can be an important role, a leading role, uh, and it's not any time from this planet. So I want to, to leave the movement as much established as possible. So, did Prabhupada, like, there, if we can see that there was, uh, that Prabhupada wrote something in his books, and in this case, what he implemented was significantly different. So, we, Prabhupada also has said in his letter that more or less I was exp I was experimenting here in, in a famous letter written Sumti Moraji also. So, in one sense, we can say that uh, that was an experimentation and it worked uh, to some extent at that time. But we, as a movement, are now going back more towards what was the what was the scriptural and the traditional standard. Is that yeah. a mm -hmm. I mean, yes, this will be a good discussion to have at the level of the leaders of the movement, maybe even also at the level in the Ministry of Sanyas, to what, to what extent do we want to, to go to the, to the classical uh, practices of Sanyas? For example, if we go to the classical practices of Sanyas, described both in the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Dharma Shastras, in terms of the eating, for example, mm. a sannyas will not have to take a full meal. Only we could live by, by taking madhukari, by practicing madhukari. But is this what we, we, we want? I'm not sure that Prabhupada will, will do that, if he will be physically present. So yes, some level of, I, I will agree that we need some level of adjustment or updating. And, and that's why one of the ideas I suggest in the book is to establish or to work on a Dharma Shastra for contemporary sannyasis. Mm. Because we do have a model of a Dharma, a Dharma Shastra for medieval sannyasis, which may be different from, from some of the, of the previous statements. Because in the medieval times, sannyasis may be living 
more in monastic settings as a community. And it was not that as much the case in, in a classical setting. I don't say there were none, but, but there seem to be less examples of that, if any. Oh, okay. So what you, so, okay. So what I meant by the medieval or the Bhagavatam standards, see, if you consider the Bhagavatam, what it describes, even for a brahmachari or even, even what Brahm, Bhagavatam describes as qualities of a shudra may also be unrealistic in today's world for many people. What to speak of, what is Bhagavatam's description of a sannyasi? So in that sense, and we can also look at, you know, how much did Prabhupada Literally, Prabhupada, Bhaktan Sitakur, literally follow what was the description of a sannyasi in the Bhagavatam. In one sense, he followed that with body, mind and words, we serve the Lord. But that's the more of an essential principle rather than specific rules. Yes. So, so there would need to be a significant level of, like you say, updating of even that those things for application in today's world. Yes. Mm. Yes, Maharaj. And uh, so, so now we... Uh, yes, even, even like now we are using compute, computers and all the all these devices. Exactly. So, so, I was thinking of the same example and I was about to speak that. <laughs> I mean, we don't see any Vedic Sanyasi with, with these devices. I mean, yeah. That what, is what to speak, we are using the social networks and I like this podcast for, for preaching Christian consciousness. And Srila Prabhupada was actually advocating for it. Mm. Sometimes even Adam and in, in a very intense ways that we use anything for Krishna's service and that's Yukta Vairagya. Yes, Maharaj. So but then we, we, may need, we may need some Dharma Shastras about I mean, this will be a debate. Should we come to the point where, in which sannyasis directly use these things, or should we point, come to the point where we say, we stop giving sannyas, only we give sannyas to true ascetics who are able to, to live very austerely and they travel and preach, but they, they, don't, they, they only use that much level of commodities. I mean, this mm. will be a whole debate, whole discussion. Yes. You know, I was traveling with Jayadvait Maharaj once. So he was traveling to one, he's staying in one devotee's house. So they said, Maharaj, what, what all facilities do you need? He says, Maharaj, Maharaj said, I am a sannyasi. I just need prasad and Wi Fi. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, so this is a contemporary context. But if we look at that, for my study, I use one book by Yadava Prakash, who used to be Ra Sri Ramanujacharya's guru, mm. who later on became his, his disciple, his follower. He became a sannyasi and he wrote this Dharma Shastra for, for uh, sannyasis of the Sri Sampradaya. It's mm. entitled Yati Dharma Samuchaya. Uh, and this could be a good, uh, a good um, uh, reference for writing a contemporary Dharma Shasta for sannyasis, for Iskon sannyasis. But then there, we will have certainly to discuss many points because one of the, one of the chapters of the Yati Dharma Samuchaya deals with the possessions of sannyasis. Oh, okay. So, and then we enter, and usually we're very, 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 very few possessions. So, mm. so but, but nowadays, nowadays, even sometimes the, the, for, for example, I, I didn't have a bank account on personal name until just very few years, 
back. Of course, I consider that whatever usually is quite empty that that bank account. It goes for ISCON projects. At one time, I went to preach to the to uh, the University of Tenerife, and the university wanted to offer an estipend for the lecture I had given in, in given there, and they asked the, my bank account. I didn't have one. I said you can deposit it in in the name of Fiscon's bank account. But they were asking so many documents in order to do that due to the bureaucracy of the university that it was easier to open a personal bank account than they sending the money to the ISCON bank account. So mm -hmm. I, I opened the bank account in this, in this way. So, so anyway, there are so many different um, considerations that are there, but it will be good to, the, to the, at, at some point to discuss them and to define how it should be or what is, what, what it is, what it is ideal, what it is acceptable, when it, it, it is unacceptable in terms of all the different aspects of the, of the, uh, external external lifestyle of a sanyasi hmm. yes mara this is going to be a quite a tough thing because uh, now how exactly are if at all we look for dharma shastras how ex what exactly will we look for in the dharma shastras which would be compatible with current current uh, current world scenarios it's going to be difficult to some extent uh, I, i'm losing the song Sorry, I I lose the, I lose few things that you said. I don't know. Maybe you yeah. need to come closer to the mic. Okay, is or it maybe... okay? Is it better now? Clear? Yes. No, it's good. So I was saying that it is going to be difficult to find even in Dharma Shastras specific statements which will address current day current day scenarios. It may ultimately be more like each devotee will have to develop their own inner spiritual compass based on scripture and of course with some guidance from others about how to move forward because uh, if we start looking in scripture first of all in general Prabhupada didn't emphasize the Dharma Shastra so much for specifics like Prabhupada referred to Manu Samrita many times uh, as a book as for guidance but not many of the things which he implemented in this con were actually based on Manu Samrita. Hmm. So in that sense, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, but for example, and here I'm going to touch a contentious topic. For example, the whole discussion of the female Diksha Guru, mm. which has created some, some polarization to the point that even there have been some members who, who have come to the point of talking about the splitting the movement for, for such a, a, a thing at some, at some mm. point due to to the different understandings. But for the duties of women, we do refer a lot to, to, to Dharma Shastras. Manu Samhita is quoted by Srila Prabhupada and we use it, but we don't use it that much for the sannyasis who are the head, the spiritual masters of the whole society. Mm. That's not very, 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 uh, I mean, yeah, it's it's, 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 it's not it's, consistent. We need, we need, we have some homework to do there as a society. True, and, very true. So it's it's uh, and in one sense, if we expect, if we, if sannyasis today were expected to follow what Manu Samhita is saying, you know, much of our uh, missionary work would get hamstrung by that significantly. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So it's a whole it requires a mature discussion for yes, ma'am. Because, for example, I remember I he, I heard from uh, I got this from the diary from one of the early sannyasis. He took sannyas in 1972, hmm. and the, it was an initiation. I think Sri Prabhupada gave sannyas to five five disciples. Hmm. Uh, 
two, maybe more, I think two of them are still sannyasis. The other three gave up. So Srila Prabhupada said, uh, when they ask him, is there, are there any rules we, we should follow in terms of eating? Should we eat less or, or in, in, com, in comparison to other, to the other devotees members of the other ashrams? Uh, Srila Prabhupada said, no, he gave, but he did mention that never regret having taken sannyas. And he explained that if you are in the house of a, a grihasta when you go for preaching and you become attracted that I could have a nice wife like, like this, this person has and, and so on, or I could have such opulence and live comfortably. Mm. He said, ne never regret having taken sannyas. But basically he said, no restrictions for other, other activities uh, com comparing to the, to the other ashrams. Specifically, I mean, in terms of eating and sleeping, of course, the vow of celibacy is very clear in, in the case of, of the sannyasi. But also for devotees who follow the votes of initiation, no illicit sex, the difference is very little. And I will, I will say that even in one way more difficult for a grihasta than for a sannyasi to externally follow, mm. isn't it? Like a grihasta, if a grihasta is following strictly no illicit sex, having sex only for procreation, this is, will be the Brahminical standard. So, so it is more difficult for, for a grihasta who has the opportunity to have an intimate connection with his wife and a sannyasi doesn't have opportunity for that. So it's easier for the sannyasi to follow in one way than for, than for the grihasta. So, Mm. You know what I mean? What? That's true. You know that is itself. Uh, you know, oh, itself it could be a whole big subject of what that particular principle means and how realistic it is. In, in uh, as you said, it's the Brahminical standard expectation. So what? So in one sense, there will always be this tension between the ideal and the we could say the practical or the real, and. Uh, how we bridge that tension is, is a challenge for every ashram and in fact for every spiritual seeker itself. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, Maharaj. So overall, uh, you know, we will provide a link for your book online, but uh, is it, uh, how has been the response to your book after you, I, I'm, uh, are there any other points you want to explore or you could focus on the book and then conclude it. Yes, I mean, the response was very good. What I did when the book was published in India, it was printed by a branch of the BBT in Spain by, by the help of Hanuman Prabhu, who, who is presently BBT trustee for Spanish, for, for Latin America and, and Spain. And he, he has like a... a a brand called Sankirtan Books for okay. publishing books, titles of other authors that may not be suitable to be directly published by the BBT yes. because of the nature of the content. So it was printed in India and I gave a copy of the book to, to, to all the GBC members and gurus and sannyasis who were present during the SGGS Sangha, I think it was 2013 or 14, when the book was, was published, maybe 2014. Uh, so I, I gave a copy and I got favorable feedback from the Buddhists who, who read it. Oh, I mean, okay. senior, 
leading devotees, which I was very happy to, to hear that because I, I was a bit, to, to be frank, I confess I was somewhat um, uh, concerned. I mean, I didn't know how, what will be the reaction because it could be taken that it was criticizing the Sanyas Ashram. And maybe somebody could take, could take offense for, for it or, so I was a bit worried. Maybe, maybe I'm misunderstood of, of what I'm doing by publishing this, this book. I did publish some statements which were somewhat heavy by some of the ex sannyasis and could be considered offensive. But I thought I should publish this because we need to, to do a, a, in order to do a proper study, we need to see what, what, is the, uh, what are the perspectives of, of our different members. Hmm. Especially those who took such a big position, which is considered like a, the, one of the topmost leading positions in the movement. So, so we need to hear, to, to look at, at, at this topic very thoroughly, or at least start looking at it. So I, I don't say the book necessarily looks at it thoroughly. Uh, it's a starting of a, of a, a discussion or it, it is a start and there is much more to be researched and considered. I usually at the end of the podcast, I try to summarize what we discussed. So I'll try to do that briefly now if you're okay. And then if you want to add some concluding words. So broadly, we discussed about your spiritual journey, how you are already, you could say, having many unusual interests that were conducive to spirituality, right? From UFOs and then yoga and other things. And in one sense, you left your education, have completed education, did some work like basic education, then you joined and over a period of time, you became a pioneer of education. And as a part of your, the affiliation of with the, of the Bhaktivedanta Institute of the educational forum with the mainstream education, you decided to do research on sannyas because it was such a central aspect of our tradition. And so the book you wrote was both in one sense autobiographical because the challenges faced by our, our sannyasi guru leaders, GBC leaders that affected everyone in a significant way, affected the faith negatively of many people, many, all many devotees. So, so we could say that in some ways, the centrality of, uh, of sannyas within ISKCON was exceptional. It was not so in the, if you look at the epics, the Ramayana and Mahabharat, it is wisdom. The sages are quite significant. The wisdom is quite significant. Sannyasis are not that much, but medieval times, it does seem to have become significant. All the Advaitic, Advaitic leaders, as well as the Vaishnav spiritual leaders took sannyas. Mahaprabhu also did that. Bhaktisana Sudhakar also did that. So while sannyas was important, but to some extent, our application of it was also a bit extremist, a bit imbalanced. And then when individual practitioners may also not have been mature enough to actually shoulder the responsibilities of sannyas as well as you know, accept the respect and uh, the, 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 the respect that comes through the sannyas ashram. So overall now we are, uh, as we are maturing as a movement, we are, as I said, in our tradition, there is an emphasis on sannyas. At the same time, there is a Kadi emphasis also. Mahaprabhu himself took sannyas, but then he heard from Ramananda Rai. So, so it's not so much the ashram as what somebody is doing in the ashram. So what are the, not in the nature of the person, what are the contributions of the person and somebody may be in the grahastha ashram also, somebody may be in a female body, but they might be doing in some cases more services than a sannyasi also. And then what Srila Prabhupada did was in some ways exceptional. And from the exceptional, when we now go towards, we could say, what is the normative, but then what is the normative thing that itself would be a challenge to determine because do we want, we cannot really, uh, turn back the clock. And even if we decide to turn back to where are we going to turn back? Is it to Mahaprabhu's times? Is it 
So if you look at dharma shastras, we need to be consistent. Can we expect the dharma shastras be applied only for women and not for sannyasis? If we apply them for sannyasis, then that will limit the uh, our capacity to do outreach. So there are a lot of questions that need to be discussed. And uh, in one sense, your book was a was a significant uh, step forward in engaging in this discussion. And uh, the fact that you could be both self-critical as well as uh, as well as gain acceptance and uh, we could say even appreciation within the movement indicates our movement's maturity maturize mature we could say maturation and also in today's world is sanyas now as as a movement has matured we have examplers of those who were successful as sanyasis and they can be an inspiration and guide for those who want to embrace sanyas and simultaneously whether somebody is sanyasi or not we all can try to carry forward prabhupad's mission and krishna's mission in whatever capacity we can any points you would like to add maharaj of course there are many more things we discussed but yes very very well summarized thank you very much chaitanya charan prabhu um, w- one thing i will mention re- regarding all these topics that need discussion shri la prabhupad wrote in his books that for a society to be successful we need to we, we need to three things i mean two in terms of the social organization and then of course overall uh, devotion to to god so cow protection and brahminical culture these are the two aspects and, and overall devotion to to god so part of a brahminical culture is to have a respectful systems for exploring all these important topics where different opinions are shared and and we can we can come to conclusions or at least in in terms of this con come to integrate as much as possible Mm. the different views in a way that will will make them the mission of spreading krishna consciousness succeed in a united way yes maharaj that's true we need ongoing discussions and these are actually major discussions if this without these discussions we will we will all have fragmented understandings which may actually lead to either uh, immature application on our side or even conflicts with among different people who have different understandings so thank you maharaj so much for your time and sharing your wisdom thank you very and much i look forward to having you uh, having you again for many more discussions in future hare krishna humble obeisances maharaj thank you very much hare krishna thank you